Hey everybody. So we've got a slightly different story time today. Um, I found a really brilliant book online from the Na National Literacy Trust and it's called The Book of Hopes. And there's lots of brilliant contributions in there. Short pieces of writing, some stories, some lovely pictures from over a hundred children's authors, some of which are really famous and brilliant authors. And I thought it'd be really nice to um, film reading some of these. If you click on the link below, you can look through it yourself and read them with your family. It'd be brilliant if some children could record themselves reading one of the books and um, send it to their teacher or send it to me. So yeah, I'd just like to share with you one of the stories from that. So like I say, it's from the Literacy Trust. It's called The Book of Hopes. Words and pictures to comfort, inspire and entertain children in lockdown. I love these really cheerful parrots on the front cover. So this book is dedicated to the doctors, nurses, carers, porters, cleaners, and everyone currently working in hospitals. You are the stuff that wild heroic tales are made of. Okay, so you can look through the contents page, lots of different stories. You can look for ones that you're really interested in yourself. Um, there's a nice picture there called the Hope Tree, which is really cute. Okay, so there's a little note about hope here. For the last few weeks, I have been hunting for hope. One of the places I've been looking has been in books. Old books, new books, terrifically serious books with footnotes in Latin, and terrifically unserious books with jokes too rude to repeat here. And I've found that with each book I read, I felt a little tougher, a little bolder, a little more ready to face the world. And I think this is why. I think stories of transformation, of wild glories and everyday glories, of magic, both real and imaginary, can act like a map. They give us a push towards hope. Real, true hope isn't the promise that everything will be all right, but it's a belief that the world has so many strangenesses and possibilities that giving up would be a mistake, that we live in a universe shot through with the unexpected. There's never been a single decade in human history when we have not taken ourselves by surprise. We, the knobbly need, wonky toothed human species, have an endless potential for change. I'm not exactly an optimist, but nor am I a pessimist. I'm a possibilityist. The possibilities out there for beauty, for transforming the world, are literally infinite. There are spectacular ideas that we will have in the next 10 years that we can't even begin to dream of now. So a few weeks ago, I began a hope project. I emailed some of the children's writers and artists whose work I love most. I asked them to write something very short, fiction or non-fiction, or draw something, anything, that would make the people reading it feel like possibilityists. Something that would make them laugh or wonder or snort or smile. The response was magnificent. We shouldn't have surprised me because I think children's writers and illustrators are professional hunters of hope. We seek it out, catching it in our nets, setting it down between the pages of a book and sending it out into the world. You could read this collection all in one sitting if you wanted to but it's designed so that you can dip into it. There are true accounts of cats and hares and plastic munching caterpillars. There are doodles and flowers, revolting poems and beautiful poems. There are stories of space travel and new shoes and elephants and dragons. None are longer than 500-ish words, so they can be devoured in a bite. One story for breakfast and another at midday, with a poem perhaps for dessert. That's Catherine Rundle, April 2020. And there's a really interesting picture of here, the world through a window. And there's a child there looking out. I'm guessing it's meant to be like she's in lockdown and she's not able to go outside looking at the beautiful birds outside. Really beautiful picture. Okay. Now the first section is called animals. I thought this would be a nice one to start with anyway, because everybody loves animals or lots of people do. So a song of gladness. I've been talking every morning to Blackbird, telling him why we're all so sad at the moment. He sits on his branch and listens. It was Blackbird's idea. He sang out this morning at dawn from his treetop in the garden to Fox half asleep behind the garden shed. She thought it was a good idea too. It was a wake up call. Fox was on her feet at once and trotting through Bluebell Wood where she barked it to a deer who ran off across the stream. Kingfisher was there, Otter and Dipper too. 
They heard and piped it on, and swallows swooped down over the meadow and passed it on to cows waiting to go into their milking, and to sheep resting quietly under the hedge with their lambs in the corner of the dew-damp field. And they all agreed, bleating it out to bees already busy at their flowers, to weaving spiders and grasshoppers and scurrying mice. Trees heard sheep calling too, the whole flock of them, and waved their budding leaves in wild enthusiasm. And high above, the clouds wandered through the skies driven by wind, and wind took Blackbird's idea over the cliffs across heaving seas, where gulls and albatross cried it out, and whales and dolphins and porpoises heard it, and wailed and whooped it down into the deep, where turtles listened, and they too loved the idea. So did plankton, and every fish and crab and sea urchin and whelk. They all whispered that it was a fine notion, the best they'd ever had. And the whisper went over the sea on the curling waves to the shores of Africa, where lions roared their approval, and elephants trumpeted it, leopards yawned it, water buffalo belched it, wild dogs yelped it, wildebeest murmured it out across the savannah, and storms, storm lifted the idea up over rainforests, where rain took it and poured it down on gorillas in the mist, on chimpanzees in their sleeping nests. Howler monkeys and gibbons echoed their calls loud over all the earth. They are that loud. And then, from far up high, sun heard it too, and shone it down over deserts, where Oryx stamped her foot, impatient to be getting on with it and doing it. She loved the idea that much. Even Camel, who rarely joined in anything, thought this was the best and most beautiful idea he had ever heard. Back in the garden, Blackbird waited till everyone was ready. And then he began to sing. And the whole carnival of animals, every li living thing on this good earth joined in until the globe echoed with the joy of it. And Blackbird was very pleased. But I was still lost in sadness as I heard the earth singing around me. It was a song of forgiveness. I knew that. So I asked Blackbird if I could join in. And he sang his answer back to me. Why do you think we are doing this, you silly man? We want you and yours to be happy again. Only then will you treat us and the world right again, as you know you should. Only then will all be well. Sing, silly man, sing, sing. Our song is your song. Your song is our song. So I sang, we all sang, sang away our sadness. In every house and flat and cottage, we clapped and sang, in every hut and tent, in every palace and hospital and prison. And they heard, and we heard our song of gladness echoing all together in glorious harmony across the universe. Mm, a song of gladness. And that was it actually written by Michael Morpurgo. And I'm sure lots of people love Michael Morpurgo books. We read them a lot in SFA. That was pretty cool to get a submission from him. Now, there's a really nice one here. It's called Care of Exotic Pets. Number one, the op oxylotl at bedtime. Now the only reason I know how to s pronounce oxylotl is because once I went to Liverpool and we saw this mysterious creature in uh, one of the museums just floating there, very strange creature floating there in the museum and this little boy with a very thick Liverpudlian accent came up and he went, Mum, it's an oxylotl. There, look, it's an oxylotl. And it was such a brilliant word to hear in a Liverpool accent. And it really helped me remember how to say it. Because look at the spelling. It's a really unusual spelling. So, oxylotl at bedtime. Never give your oxylotl chocolatel in a bottle. Serve it in a tiny egg cup. Not too cold and not too hotle. Make him sip it very slowly. Not too much, never a lotle. After all, he's just a sleepy, snuggly bedtime oxylotl. Then tuck him in very gently in his hand-carved wooden cottle. Turn the light out, 7.30, never later, on the dottle. Sing him songs of salamanders, give it everything you've got all, as there's nothing like a tune to serenade your oxylotl. Brush his gills out on the pillow, never mind the wise or wattle. Once he's deeply all a slumber, sweetly snoring, off you trottle. Think of him snug in his dreamland, flying kites or sailing yachtle. Then you'll sigh, you've done your duty. Time to clean the pans and pottle. Come tomorrow, he'll be one fresh, keen as mustard, 
oxylotl. So that was the care of exotic pets number one, the oxylotl at bedtime, Catherine Johnson. All right, and if anyone wants an extra little art project, the arc oxylotls are really interesting, weird creatures. They're a bit like, I can't remember if they're, an, I think they might be some, they're a fish, but they look like an amphibian, I think. They're very interesting creatures. They look a bit like, they look a bit like something you'd find in um, Fantastic Beasts by J.K. Rowling. Anyway, see you next time for more from the Book of Hopes. Remember, you can click on the link and have a little look yourself if you'd like. Take care, guys.